right to please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. Now, why do I ask you every week to open your Bible? I really mean it, okay? You know, that's why I say go get a Bible. Make sure you have one uh, because here's the deal. I'm not standing up here week after week telling you something new or different. That's not my job. I'm here as a herald of this word, and God wants to speak to you through his word directly. But you need to open it. You need to look at it. You need to see it yourself. You need to verify if what I am saying is true to what he has said. Now, I don't want to uh, put any concerns in you. You can trust me, but I want you to see it in your Bible. I want you to grow in your ability to desire this, to open it, and to hear from God directly. Okay? Now, have you ever played the game? Might have been at a party, at someone's house, a family gathering. Ever played the game telephone? All right? All right, well, if you haven't, it's, it's a fun kind of icebreaker sort of game. You really need a group of, of at least 10 people. And the way it works is the first person whispers a phrase. Sometimes it's kind of a silly phrase, you know, koala bears are cute and panda bears are cuddly. Okay, but they whisper it. Nobody else knows what it is. Then they whisper to the next person one time. They whisper to the next person until it goes all the way around the room. And what is the predictable result in this game? Yes, chaos, the message has changed, usually in funny and sometimes bizarre ways. How did that get so messed up? Well, this is what happens when we don't have a written orderly account of well, what happened or what did they say? You see, Luke wrote this gospel, this letter, really, to a, someone named Theophilus. And uh, we read it there in chapter 1, 3 to 4. He, he wrote the letter to help him, to help us have certainty about the things that we have been taught, uh, the things that we've heard. Um, friends, what you hold in your hand is God's word. Okay, we, we don't need to play the telephone game when it comes to the most important truths in the world. Uh, the most important truths about God, the most important truths about you, about our world, about how to see life and understand the problems uh, in our world correctly. God has spoken, right? And the details, they really matter. So it is with a sober sense of privilege and responsibility and anticipation that I say every week, what do I say? Please open your Bibles um, so we can hear what God has to say, so we can have this certainty about the things that we've been taught and we believe. Amen? If I were a Bible church, okay? Well, remember all the Gospels, there's four of them, really they're a highlight reel, okay, of Jesus' life and ministry uh, John wrote in his gospel, he told us why he, he wrote what he wrote in John chapter 20. We'll put it on the screen. He said, listen, friends, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book, okay? I didn't write everything down. I wrote down what I wrote down for this reason. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John tells us why he wrote his book, that you believe and have life. Luke tells us why he wrote his gospel, so that you'd have certainty. And last week we saw, he wants you to know, chapter 2 of Luke, that Jesus was fully man. He was born fully a baby. He had to grow up. He had to mature until the time was right in his own life until the time was right in the world for him to play his part and fulfill his mission 
as the Savior. Now, chapter 3 of Luke. He gets very specific about the timing of Jesus' coming. He wants you to know that Jesus came at the right time. Because God's timing is always perfect. And as we see this about Jesus' life, there's a message for us too. So this is our big idea. All right? God's timing in your life is always perfect. Now, you may not always feel that way. Um, God's ways are not man's ways. There's mystery. There's things we don't understand. There's things we don't see. But part of why we do what we do here, opening this book, listening to God, okay, is to realign our hearts, our minds, to recalibrate. It's just so easy in our world to get distracted, to get diverted. There's so many information channels out there that we can be listening to that are trying to get your attention. And so what we do here, what I encourage you to do daily as you open your Bible and read, is to turn the dial of your heart, your soul, of your mind to what it is that God is saying, to get on God's page and then make progress in maturity. It's not going to happen all at once, but over time, understanding God's plan, the part he's asking you to play, and then growing in confidence, in certainty. God knows what he's doing in my life. God knows what he's doing in this world. And his timing, it's always perfect. His timing to send the Savior was perfect. His timing for me in my life is perfect as well. Let me pray for us as we dive into that. God, <clears throat> this is some serious recalibration, Lord. Uh, we think we know. We think we've got it all figured out. Uh, but we just see in a mirror dimly. Lord, it's just foggy for us. But you know exactly what's going on. Lord, you, you knew when Jesus came, <clears throat> when it was the right time, you've known throughout history, which means you know right now what's the right time for us, for our world. So help us to get on your page. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Does God know what he's doing? Yes. <laughs> It's good to be reminded of that, all right, in these crazy times. And uh, we can grow in confidence and faith because, hey, the world was crazy in the time of Jesus, too. Uh, trust me. So here's what God is saying. When God moves, the time is always right. It is always right in the world. Time is always right in the world. Let's read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. All right, so these two verses, we see several things about the way that God works in the world. First is this, God works through geopolitical rulers. Okay? God works through them. Uh, most of these names, these, these are real people. Um, they're going to play some part in the story of Jesus. God used them and their positions of authority to accomplish his will in the world. Okay, so Luke places the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry very precisely in history. What does he say? The 15th year of the Roman emperor Tiberius. We know exactly when that was. Okay, on our calendars, that was 28 to 29 
A.D. Exactly during that year. Now, when Jesus was born, the local ruler at the time under Rome was King Herod the Great, um, the guy who met the wise men, okay, the guy who killed all the babies um, around Bethlehem because he was threatened by a new king. Well, when he died, uh, Rome divided up his kingdom four ways. Okay, That's what a tetrarch is, one-fourth. So you have rulers over one-fourth of what Herod the Great ruled. They're a tetrarch. And by the time of Jesus and John, that they're ready to do their work, uh, three of these were still ruled by, by three of Herod's successors uh, that they're mentioned right here in the text. But the fourth tetrarch uh, was eventually assigned to a uh, Roman governor. And at the time of this story, that governor's name was Pontius Pilate. Okay, We're not making this up. All of this is real history. You can verify all of that in non-biblical sources. So Luke, he's writing this because he wants you to be certain. This is not a fairy tale or a myth. The events of this gospel happened in real time, in a real place, in real history. And God positioned all of those leaders to be in place, to play their part at the right time. You see, world leaders are pawns when it comes to God accomplishing his will. It was true then. It's true today. And, and this is some really good news. Um, wicked leaders, ungodly leaders, they are not a hindrance to God. They're not a hindrance to God accomplishing his will. Can we get an amen? amen. <laughs> They're not as much as you think they might be, or you hear people saying, woe is me, and this is the end. They are not a hindrance to God. Well, next, we see that God works through uh, cultural realities. Okay, there's three significant things about the timing of when Jesus came that indicate it was the right time in the world culturally. Now, this is not explicit in our text, but these uh, are and were realities. First was Roman peace. It's called the Pax Romana. Okay, the world was in a time of unprecedented peace. Why? Rome had conquered everything. <laughs> There are no opponents. Um, and this was significant for the spread of the gospel. Right? So the rulers here played a part in that. Second uh, cultural reality was Roman roads. Okay, travel in the ancient world was not easy, but Rome loved to build roads. Some of the roads are still around today. Um, it helped their armies to move around as well as commerce. But guess what? These roads also helped in the spread of the gospel. It was the right time in the world for God to send a savior for the world. And the third cultural reality we see is, is a Greek language. Okay, it's called lingua franca, okay, a common language. Thanks to Alexander the Great, okay, he came 300 years before, but one of the things he did is he made everybody speak Greek. So the Greek language was spoken everywhere. This enabled the early church to communicate the gospel wherever they went. So do you know what language your New Testament was originally written in? Greek. Greek. New Testament was Greek because that's what everybody spoke. Well, Jesus came at the right time in the history of the world. Obviously not an accident. God knew what he was doing then. He knows what he's doing now. And when God moves in the world, here is what he also does. He moves in personal revelation. What does verse 2 say? The word of God came to who? John. Okay, now Luke already told us the amazing story of how John the Baptist was born in chapter 1. But as John grew, as he matured, as he listened to God, 
as John was faithful to his God-appointed purpose, Luke tells us the word of God came to John in the wilderness. God is not silent. He speaks to men. He reveals himself and his word in very personal ways. And he still does. The question is, when God moves, when he speaks, are we listening? Now, if God did all of this in a world that was really far more brutal and in many ways just as evil as the world is today, then we can have certainty about this. God can and does move in our geopolitical situation. God can, and he does use rulers today, however wicked. They're pawns to him. He uses cultural realities, including, wow, some pretty powerful cultural realities for us today. The internet, okay, uh, airplanes to get around. Um, the English language, believe it or not, is kind of the lingua franca for today. But most importantly, God still moves in personal revelation. He speaks to men and women who will listen and obey. And that's what we see next. Okay, when God moves, the time is always right in our lives. So this next section here is Luke's account of the ministry of John the Baptist. It's actually in all four Gospels. John was in many ways, the last Old Testament prophet. Um, later in Luke, we'll actually hear Jesus call him the greatest man ever born to a woman. Um, God sent him to prepare the way, to prepare hearts. He sent him to point people to what God was doing through Jesus. And it's a story I know you're familiar with, but I want you to see its relevance today because God's timing in our lives is always what? Perfect. Perfect. We know he's moving when he does this. First, he sends a messenger. Let's uh, start reading at the end of verse 2 through 6. So the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Some of you are humming the Messiah right now as you hear those words. Well, every follower of Jesus has some kind of salvation story. You know that, right? You're, you're not born a Christian. That's not how it works. At some point in your life, you understood the gospel and you believed. But in order for that to happen, someone had to be a messenger in your life. Someone had to share that news. Who was that for you? Uh, a parent, a friend, um, a preacher, a teacher, a coach. Okay, someone was an obedient messenger in your life. They cared enough about you to tell you about Jesus. Aren't you grateful for that person? Yes. Yes. Now, it's not easy to be a messenger of God in an evil world. When that messenger first came to you, you may, may have made life hard for them, okay? Being a messenger means you stand out, you're different, you say things other people aren't saying, um, you take risks to be an obedient messenger. Uh, John was really different. <laughs> he really stood out, and eventually he paid a price for his faithfulness to the message. We see in verse 20, he gets arrested he gets put in jail, and we know eventually he gets killed. Um, 
When God moves, he gives personal revelation and he sends a messenger. Um, He sent someone to you. Um, If you're following Jesus, he is sending you uh, as a messenger to others. So are you willing to be different? Are you willing to stand out? Are you willing to maybe suffer um, to be a, a messenger? So he sends a messenger. But next, he sends a messenger who brings a message. Who brings a message. Let's see what John's message was starting in verse 7. John said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow, great way to start a sermon. You brood of vipers! (laughs) Not necessarily the way to win friends and influence people. Um, But being popular was not John's goal. Shouldn't be my goal. Shouldn't be our goal. God was on the move, and the time was right in people's lives. They, They needed to hear this message, this warning, this call to repentance. Okay, so every salvation story, most likely yours included, has a messenger But it also has this. It has a hungry heart. God was moving in John's day. People were hungry. It says crowds of people came out to hear his preaching and to be baptized. Hey, y'all got to hear this guy. He called you a brood of vipers. Let's go. You know, there was hungry hearts to want to listen to that. And John didn't sugarcoat the message. The time was right in the world. The time was right in these people's lives. And and part of sharing the good news is hey, being honest about the bad news. Uh, the good news, there's a cure. That's only good news if you know that there's a disease. Okay? If you don't think you need the cure, it's not good news. Um, judgment is coming, John says. Wrath is coming. Fire is coming. Hungry hearts will listen to that. But either way, when God moves, he sends a messenger with a message, third thing, that calls for a response. Okay, we know God is on the move, and, and it calls for a response. So let's read uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 20. Well, the crowds asked John, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. The crowds came to John. They said, what shall we do? 
Okay, when God's word is clearly and boldly proclaimed, this is the right response. What shall we do? So you know the time is right in someone's life when you see that kind of a response. Um, and, it, and it includes these three things. First, it's from the heart. Okay? So you know that response. God is moving in them when it's from the heart. There has to be a genuine personal faith. And John confronts the Jews who thought just because they were Jews, they were okay. He says there in verse 8, don't, don't say we have Abraham as our father. Listen, your family of origin is important. It's an important part of who you are, but it's not what saves you. Yeah, but my parents are Christians. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up going to church. Well, I heard a preacher say once that God has no grandchildren. God has no grandchildren. He has only children. Um, every generation has to decide on their own own response to believe. It's not your parents. They may play an important role as messengers with a message, but you don't become a grandchild. Okay, He only has children. And then this, a response that includes repentance. John's message was primarily proclaiming a baptism of repentance. The word repent at its root means to turn, to turn around. Okay, when I repent, I say, I was going this direction in my life, but now I'm turning around and I'm going another direction. It's a turning to God. But that means it's also a turning away from something else. So when I repent, it's not, I get my cake, I get to eat it too. No, I'm turning from those things. I'm going the other direction. I'm going to God. And starting there in verse 10, he tells the crowds, what does he tell them to basically do? Be generous. <laughs> Share. Show love. Be compassionate. To the tax collectors, to the soldiers, he says, be content. Be honest. Don't abuse their power and authority for selfish gain you know the time is right, that God is moving in someone's life when they truly repent. Okay, you, not, you don't just smell that. You see it. It's obvious. You don't go going, well, I wonder if they really believed. Um, repentance is obvious. And it, it includes the next thing, that response should do this. It should demonstrate fruit. Okay, in verse 8, John says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. We've said this many times, the fruit in our lives that's so important is not what saves us. Okay, we're not saved because of our fruit. Fruit is what proves we are what we say we are. Okay, apples don't make the tree an apple tree. Okay, apple trees make apples. But if a tree never produces apples, ever, there's a very good chance of what? Not an apple tree. At the very least, it's a very sick apple tree. But there's a good chance that's not an apple tree. So Jesus is going to talk a lot about fruit in the coming chapters. And John describes Jesus' ministry in verse 17. You see it? like that of a harvester who winnows the grain um, harvest to separate the fruit. Okay, A winnower would take a shovel and they would throw the grain up in the air and, and the grain would separate from the chaff on the outside. The chaff would blow away. And these represent two responses to the message and calls to believe and repent. Hungry hearts who believe, hungry hearts who repent, they're like the tree that bears fruit. They're like the grain that is gathered into the barn. It's protected. But those who reject the message, who don't believe, who don't repent, they're like that tree that never bears fruit. John says that tree will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Those who reject the message will be like that chaff that blows away, that Jesus separates. And what does he do with it? 
He says he throws it into the fire. So when God moves, this is what happens. He exposes our hearts. He throws it up in the air and, and, and things become clear. Um, King Herod, uh, John spoke the truth to King Herod. He, he reproved him for the evil things that he had done. Okay, so how did Herod respond? Not well. <laughs> uh, and John got locked up in prison, in verse 20. And we saw it last week. God's purpose in your life will bring opposition. The smell of Jesus on you will smell like life to some. And it will smell like death to others. Now we're going to get to this in Luke chapter 7. But as John sat there in prison, he began to question things. I appreciate the Bible is so honest about this. We'll get to it in Luke 7. But John basically says, did I get it right? Um, I mean, if I heard God correctly and I was faithful to proclaim the message of repentance to point people to Jesus, then why am I in jail? That's what John was questioning. Um, when life gets hard, we tend to question God. But what's our big idea today? God's timing in your life is what? Perfect. Always perfect. Even John knew this, okay? I mean, he says it right here in verse 16. You know, the one who is coming, Jesus He's greater than me. He's mightier than me. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. Okay, in John's gospel, John the Baptist tells his followers, he must increase, I must decrease. John knew that was his purpose. To prepare the way and then get out of the way. As heralds, as messengers, this is what we do. We proclaim the good news. We prepare the way. And then we get out of the way. For who? Jesus. Okay. So when God moves, third thing, the time is always right for Jesus. It's always right. So here, now we get to Jesus' baptism, and then we get a family genealogy. Uh, Luke is including this for a reason. He wants us to have confidence certainty about Jesus, who he was, what he came to do. But in this, there are some applications for us. So I want us to see this. God works first through his power and his pleasure. So let's look at chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Okay, so when John baptized Jesus, God put on a show. I mean, I'm, the only thing I can think of is some of those Avenger movies and the sky opens and you see into a whole other dimension. It was a very supernatural, intentional display as he commissions Jesus publicly for his appointed purpose. Now, the Bible never uses the word Trinity. Did you know that? The Bible never uses the word Trinity to describe God, but the doctrine of the Trinity is critical to our understanding of God. It's true. It's how we see God functioning in the world and in our lives. God is one being. But he exists somehow in three persons. And we see them all on display right here in these two verses. Jesus, the God-man, is being baptized. God, the Holy Spirit, descends on him like a dove. And God, the Father, speaks. And everyone hears it. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now, we're going to see this next week, but the very next thing that Jesus does is Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Jesus 
full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time of testing. This is how God works. And when he moves in our lives, he does the same thing that he did with Jesus. Like Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so the Holy Spirit gives us power. Not to do whatever we want to do, but to bear witness to Jesus. The time is always right to talk about Jesus. And God will give you the power you need to do that. But we also see in the story that God works through our personal preparation. Just a quick note there. Um, 23. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. 30 years. Okay, remember last week we talked about it. Jesus had to grow up. Okay, maturity takes time, faithfulness, it takes obedience. Now, Jesus never sinned. We know that, but he still had to grow up. He still had to mature. And remember, his family was poor. Now, at some point, we assume his father, Joseph, died. Okay, he was alive when he was 12 years old. But by the time Jesus is 30, he comes on the scene, we don't see Joseph anymore. We see Mary, his mother, but there's, there's no Joseph. We know that Jesus had at least seven younger siblings. And we know that the family started out very poor. So who is the oldest child? Jesus, right? Um, Jesus had to be the man of the family. He had to help his mom. He was a carpenter by trade. Jesus worked hard. If you're working hard to support your family in difficult times, Jesus knows what that's like. And we, we saw last week, even at the age of 12, he understood his identity. He knew that God was his father, but for another 18 years, until he's 30, he patiently prepared. He faithfully cared for his family. He was a devout and obedient Jew. Why did Jesus need 30 years? I don't know. But God's timing is always what? Always perfect. It was for Jesus. It is for you. God's timing in your life is always perfect. But even for Jesus, it took patience. It took faith. Personal preparation. It's an important part of how God works in our lives and in our world. Okay, Jesus had to grow up. He had to wait for the right time. So, Whatever is happening in your life, in your world, God knows. God is in control. His timing for you is always perfect. And then we see this, that God works through <clears throat> our paternal history. Would anyone like to read this genealogy aloud? Yeah, that could get a little uh, clumsy and difficult. Names you've never heard of or know how to pronounce. We're actually not going to read it today. I'll let you do that on your own. But Luke includes it for a few reasons. First, as the Messiah, listen, Jesus had to meet certain very specific criteria that had been prophesied. Obviously, he had to be a Jew. So he is descended from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, verse 34. He had to be from the tribe of Judah, verse 33. He had to be descended from King David, 
Verse 31, check, check, check. But most of these names don't ring a bell. Never heard of that person. It's the only time their name is mentioned. But these were real people who lived real lives, who raised real families. And they all played a part in God's plan that for many of these people was mostly unrecognized. They played their part. Maybe the world didn't know what their part was to recognize it. But not by God. He knew. Do you ever feel unrecognized for the part that you're playing? Nobody knows. I've come, I go, nobody's going to know. God knows. And God's timing in each of these persons' lives was perfect. But what we do know about these names is uh, these were not perfect people. We know that some of them did scandalous things. God knows your family of origin. You probably don't even know the names of your great-great-grandparents. Anybody know the names of your great-great-grandparents? I don't. Isn't that crazy? I don't know even their names. But here's a cool thing. I believe my Bible. I believe we are all descended from Adam. I believe that. And because of the flood, I believe we're all descended from Noah. Now, it's not a leap of faith. Uh, The Bible tells us that science actually confirms that we all come from the same DNA. So starting in verse 36, I want to read you the end of Jesus' genealogy. And as I do that, maybe you've never done this before but I'm reading you your genealogy. This is part of your genealogy, starting in verse 36. The son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke wants you to know that your paternal history is not an obstacle to you playing your part in God's plan. It was not an obstacle for Jesus. (laughs) Jesus came at the right time. Luke wants you to know that God works through our families, even with all their imperfections. And he placed you in your generation for such a time as this. Do you believe that? God's timing in your life is always perfect. We just need to play our part. Now, I saw a Facebook post from my cousin this week. She's a mom with three daughters. And she posted something that a friend of hers wrote. And I I asked her, I said, hey, who wrote that? And she didn't write me back, but I'm going to give her the credit for it. It's a response to the concern that many parents have about our world today. You know, we see all this craziness going on in the world and we think, oh, what a terrible time for our kids to grow up and to try to live their lives. I'm glad I won't be here, but I'm so sorry for them. And I just thought this post was a great response that recognizes God's timing in your life is always perfect. It was for Jesus. It is for you. It is for our kids. So let me just read it. You can follow along. Terry Taylor, my cousin, her married name, Noble. This was January 10th. Don't feel sorry for or fear for your kids because the world they're going to grow up in is not what it used to be. God created them and called them for the exact moment and time that they're in. Their life wasn't a coincidence or an accident. Raise them up to know the power they walk in as children of God. Train them up in the authority of His word. Teach them to walk in faith, knowing that God is in control. Empower them to know they can change the world. 
Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by the state of the world, but hopeful they can do something about it. Do your children, do your grandchildren hear you just moan and groan? Or do you encourage them in faith? Next slide. Every person in all of history has been placed in the time that they were in because of God's sovereign plan. He knew Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew David could handle Goliath. He knew Esther could handle Haman. He knew Peter could handle persecution. He knows that your child, your grandchild, can handle whatever challenge they face in their life. He created them specifically for it. Don't be scared for your children, but be honored that God chose you to parent or grandparent the generation that is facing the biggest challenges of our lifetime. Rise up to the challenge. Raise Daniels and Esther's, David's, Peter's. God isn't scratching his head wondering what he's going to do with this mess of a world. He has an army he's raising up to drive back the darkness and make him known all over the earth. Isn't that good? I'll share it on our Facebook page. Be encouraged. But let's rise up to the challenge. God's timing for what is happening in your life right now is what? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Amen. So let's trust him. Let's play our part. Let's pray. God, wow, thank you for this reminder, this truth. As we think about what's happening in our lives, as we think of what's happening in our country and in our world, Lord, we know the time is perfect. Where we live, why we live, where we live, when we live there, what we're doing, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, all of it, Lord, is in your hands to use to accomplish your will and your purpose in our world and in our lives, your timing. Absolutely and always perfect. It's perfect. So God, as we go out from here, we're going to be tempted to get distracted. We're going to be tempted to listen to other voices. We don't want to do that. God, we want to stay on your page. I want to stay dialed in to your voice. So God, let your words be the loudest thing in our lives. And we play a part in that by setting our hearts on the other. Amen.